Well, it's good to see you guys. My name's Matt Carter, the founding pastor here at The Stone. Serve as the pastor of preaching here. I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. We're going to be in chapter 6 together. If you didn't bring a Bible, that's fine. We have, uh, we're going to have the scriptures on the screen. And we're going to be in a lot of different scripture today quickly. And so um, hang with me best you can. Today we come to the very last section of the book of Ephesians. If this is your first time at the stone, one of the things that we do is we preach verse by verse through different books of the Bible. And for a while now we've been in the book of Ephesians. And I want to take just a second to kind of remind us wh where we're at in the book of Ephesians, what we're doing. And in Ephesians chapter 1 through 3, basically Paul breaks uh, the book down in two sections. He's got Ephesians 1 through 3 and then Ephesians 4 through 6. In Ephesians 1 through 3, what Paul does is he's just telling us everything that God has done for us um, to, to save us from our sin and to win us back to him. That's, a, that's Ephesians 1 through 3. It's about the cross. It's about our sin. It's about Jesus saving us through his blood. Ephesians 2 kind of sums it up there. It says, for we were dead in our trespasses and in our sins. But God, being rich in mercy, made us alive together with him, for it's by grace we have been saved. That's, in a nutshell, Ephesians chapter 2. Now, Ephesians, or, or rather, 1 through 3. In Ephesians 4 through 6, what Paul does is he teaches us how we're to live in light of what God has done for us. He teaches us how we're going to live in light of what he's done for us. The scripture says that we were darkness, but now we are the light. And so we're going to approach every single circumstance in our life differently than the world does because of who we are in Jesus. Now, as Paul's kind of land in the plane on the letter of Ephesians, um, here's what he's going to do. He's going to do two different things. The first thing he's going to do is this, as he's ending the letter, is he's going to tell us that we have a very real and very powerful enemy. That's the first thing he's going to do. He's going to say all this stuff that we've talked about, about God saving us from our sin and, and how we're supposed to live and, and sexual purity and, and honoring our parents and loving our husbands and wives, all that stuff. It, here's the thing you need to know. Paul is saying there's going to be an enemy that comes against you in that endeavor to do that. That's the first thing he's going to tell us. And then he's going to end it all by telling us how we're to fight this very real enemy that comes against us. In other words, what Paul does with the rest of the chapter is he talks to us about spiritual warfare, about spiritual warfare. So let me read this to you. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Paul says, finally. In other words, all the stuff we've been talking about, this is the end. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And then he drops it. He says, here's your enemy. In verse 12, he says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil and the heavenly places. Paul ends the letter by reminding you and me that you and I are in a fight. He's like, whether or not you think you are, whether or not you've thought about it, you are in a battle against a very real and very powerful spiritual enemy. Now, I want to talk for just a second broadly about spiritual warfare. Now, when it comes to, when it comes to spiritual warfare, and you may have heard it preached on throughout the years, there's usually um, two groups of people. Most people fall into one of two categories in regards to spiritual warfare. And both of these categories, I think, fall into one extreme or the other in regards to the subject. I think on one end of the spectrum, you have a group of people that um, swing this way because they give, G, or, or they give Satan too much credit for everything that happens bad in their life, everything that happens bad in the world. If something bad happens, Satan did it. If they sinned, Satan made me do it. These are people that are that kind of view themselves as constant victims of satanic attack. Now what's good about this group of people is that they are very aware of the fact that we do have a real enemy that the Bible says we have. But kind of the downside of this group of people um, is that I think they probably put too much emphasis on Satan and his power when the scripture doesn't. Okay, now, there's a, there's a group of people on the whole other end of the spectrum and I would be willing to bet, passion you guys for a while, I would be willing to bet that there's more of us in the room that fall kind of on this category. And this is a group of people that are more or less indifferent to Satan's existence in the world. 
I mean, you're the kind of person that if somebody were to walk up to you and say, hey, do you believe that Satan exists? You would say, yes. If somebody would ask you, do you believe in, in demonic forces in the world, that that's real, that that's not just some myth made up by the Bible? You'd say yes. But at the same time, you probably don't spend much time in your life thinking about the reality that there is a very real enemy that's desire is to take you out at the, at the most and the least to render you ineffective for the kingdom of God. Here's what I want you to hear is that I believe that both of those extremes are wrong and both of them are unbiblical. And in one aspect, we, we don't need to fear Satan because of the power of God in our lives. We don't need to fear him and we don't need to walk around constantly uh, consumed with fear for him. But at the same time, the Bible does not dismiss Satan and it does not dismiss his power and there, therefore we shouldn't either. And so here's what I want to do the rest of our time today is I want to talk about our enemy. I want to talk about Satan. I'm going to, I'm going to spend some time talking about since we're in this fight, like the Bible says we are, I want to talk to you and teach you on um, some of the things the Bible says about Satan. And before I do that, I want to say this. I'm not going to spend any time today uh, speaking to skeptics um, about the existence of Satan. I'm not going to spend any time trying to convince people that don't believe that Satan exists. There's a kind of a famous line that's probably been overused. It came from the usual suspects back in the day in the 90s, movie in the 90s, but says that the greatest trick that Satan ever played on humanity is convincing people that he didn't exist. And I think that's probably true, but there's a very simple reason why I believe in the existence of Satan. And it's because Jesus believed in the existence of Satan. And if Jesus said Satan is real, I'm sticking with Jesus. All right, cool, Can we, we're moving on from there. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you three things that the Bible says that Satan is, three things about Satan that's true, and then I want to give you three things that the scripture says Satan is not with the idea that hopefully we can walk away from here knowing more about this enemy that the Bible says we face. So here's the first thing, if you're taking notes, the first thing the Bible says that is true about Satan. Number one, Satan is a formidable and brilliant and powerful enemy. He's a formidable and brilliant and powerful enemy. All you got to do to see that is go back to the story of Adam and Eve. You know, and I saw something this week that I've never, never seen before, never thought about before. But a lot of times we have the tendency, when we look at the story of Adam and Eve, we have a tendency to look at Adam and Eve as kind of these really gullible and naive, stupid people. I mean, think about it. God says, hey, don't eat an apple. And they walk in, they're like, oh, I ate an apple. And everything falls apart because of them. And so we have a tendency to kind of look at them and go, what were y'all thinking when we think they're stupid and naive? But here's the thing. The narrative of that story is not a narrative of two really naive people that got duped by Satan. And here's why. We forget that Adam and Eve, and listen carefully, Adam and Eve did not have fallen minds when Satan deceived them. They didn't have fallen minds like you and I do. They hadn't sinned yet. And, and because they didn't have fallen sinful minds at that point when Satan came to them, they were probably wiser than us. Um, they were probably more intelligent than us. They were probably more spiritually sensitive than us. And on top of all that, they were in absolute perfect fellowship with the Lord. They knew God. They walked with God. They spent time with God. They worshiped God face to face. And yet Satan brilliantly comes into the picture and deceives these two people with unfallen minds. If Satan can do that, if Satan can deceive two people with unfallen minds, how much more is he, does he have the ability to deceive us who have fallen minds? And so we need to understand that about Satan. He's brilliant and he's powerful. I want to look at, tell you another thing, of the, uh, the way the Bible describes Satan's power. It's in Revelation chapter 12. Don't turn there. I just want to read a verse to you. Um, there's, a, there's a scene in heaven where um, the armies of the Lord and the armies of Satan are fighting each other. Now, I'm not going to get into all the details of when this is happening or why this is happening. If Holly M wants to preach a sermon series on Revelation, we're going to let him do that later on. But I'm just going to read the verse to you. Is that cool? All right, here we go. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. It said, now a war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. Now, you think, who's Michael? Michael is what's called the archangel. 
Michael is the most powerful of God's angels. He's like, he's the man. I'm looking forward to meeting Michael one day in heaven. That's gonna be pretty cool. I don't know what he's gonna look like, but I'm fired up about it. But Michael is the archangel. He's the top one. And so what happens is you've got in heaven, you've got the, the dragon, which is Satan, and his demons, his angels, they pick a fight. And what God does is God sends Michael, the archangel, to deal with it. Okay, so it, 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 God could have easily destroyed Satan at that point, but he doesn't, and that's another sermon for another day. But the point I'm trying to make is this, is that when Satan picks a fight, God sends his most powerful angel to deal with the situation. His most powerful angel. And, and, and here's the thing, that ought to give us a sobering picture of what it has to look like when you and I have to deal with Satan. Satan is incredibly powerful. Listen to um, how Paul describes Satan's power to destroy us physically in this life in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Let me give you the context of what's happening here. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, and we've got a guy that's in sexual immorality. He's in unrepentant sexual immorality. And Paul's going to write the church in Corinth and say, hey, I want you to remove him from the protection of the body of Christ. And watch what he says Satan's going to do to him in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 4. Paul says, when you're assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, that's what we're doing right now, the church. We're assembling in the name of the Lord Jesus. And my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus. Watch what he says in verse five. He says, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Paul says, here's what I want you to do. You've got this guy. He will not repent of his sexual sin. And so I want you to remove him from the spiritual protection of the church. And when you do, Satan's going to have a heyday on him and destroy his flesh. And when Satan does that, maybe it'll save his spirit and he'll come back to the Lord. And so we see from the text that Satan has the power to affect us physically. Church, listen, Satan is not like the movies make him out to be. This kind of wimpy guy in a red suit with a pitchfork. The Bible describes him as a very powerful spiritual being. Okay, that's the first thing we need to know about Satan. He's powerful. Here's number two. Satan's not only powerful, but he's determined. He's determined. Um, watch in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Listen to Peter here describing Satan. He says, be sober-minded. When you're thinking about Satan, be sober-minded. Be watchful. Peter says, for your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking, to de seeking someone to devour. And if anybody ought to know what it's like to be attacked by Satan, it's Peter. And I'll show you why in just a second. Peter says, you need to wake up. You need to be watchful because our enemy is like a lion and he prowls around and he's looking for someone to devour. That's a strong word. I, um, I heard a, a story not, it was a couple of months ago. A friend of mine is a, a guy he hunts, and he doesn't just like hunt deer in Texas or quail or stuff like that. He hunts in Africa, and uh, he goes on these big safaris and hunts all these crazy animals. And, and just to save you an email to me, just, no, I don't do that. I don't believe in like killing giraffes while they're eating leaves and stuff. I'm not into that. But this guy does this, and, and he was hunting lion, which is pretty manly, I guess. But he's hunting lion, and they found this lion, and they, they got a shot at him, and they shot this lion, and they wounded him. Didn't kill him, and the lion runs off. And so they're tracking with these guides from Africa. They're tracking this lion for miles. And like all day long, they track him. They're following his tracks. But then all of a sudden, the, the tracks just disappeared. And the, the guides decided, hey, we're just going to keep going in this direction. And maybe we're going to find this lion as we keep going down this path. And so they went a few more miles. They couldn't find any tracks. And all of a sudden, the guide says, stop. And they all stop. And the guy kind of whispers, turn around slowly. So they turn around slowly. And then standing there about 30 yards away is this lion is looking right at him. And the lion charges them. And the guide does not let my friend shoot. The guide takes the gun out of my friend's hand as this lion is charging. And they shoot the lion. And the lion drops like 10 feet in front of him. And here's the thing. He said that, he said what, what creeped him completely out, my friend said this. He said they went back and they, they looked back over the trail that they had been following and they realized that the lion's tracks were on top of their, tra their tracks. And so there came a point in time in the hunt where they had stopped hunting the lion and the lion had started hunting them. 
And he said he just got chills coming down his spine for the first time in his life. He was the one being hunted. And, and that's what Peter says is going on in our lives. And most of us don't even think about it. That we have an enemy that's been wounded. Now he received a mortal wound on the cross. You need to understand that. That on the cross of Jesus, Jesus dealt Satan a mortal blow. But he is not dead yet. He's not dead yet. And Peter, who knows all this too well, says he is roaming about like a roaring lion. And he is seeking somebody to devour. And what, um, what I think is going on here and what Peter's trying to say is you've got to wake up. Make sure you're not one of these people. And so Satan is powerful. Satan is determined. And lastly, Satan is calculating. Satan is calculating. In other words, Satan is not unthinking. He, he, he's not some random person that just goes around causing chaos. He's calculating in what he does. As a matter of fact, Genesis 3, God says that he's the most crafty um, of all of creation. He, he's very specific in his plans for us. Go back to the text in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Paul says, finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. And then look at verse 11. He says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Paul says, you got to put on the armor of God. Here's why. So that you'll be able to stand against that. That word means coordinated attacks of our enemy. And so not only is he powerful, not only is determined, but what the scripture is saying is that uh, Satan has a very specific plan for how he wants to take you out. Now, let me read this to you. I want to, uh, we see this in the text in Luke chapter 22, verse 31. And I want you to listen to Satan's plan for Peter. In chapter 22 of Luke, verse 31, this is Jesus speaking. And Jesus says to Peter, he says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. And so this is the last night before Jesus is crucified. Jesus looks at Peter and says, Peter, I need to tell you something. Me and Satan had a conversation. And he asked me permission, and I'm going to, that, that's haunting and very comforting at the same time, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But Satan comes to Jesus and says, um, Jesus, I want your permission to sift Peter like wheat. Now, I have no idea what it means to sift somebody like wheat, but it sounds bad, amen? <laughs> he says, I'm going to sift him like wheat. Jesus can have permission. And then Jesus continues and says, Peter, but I have prayed for you. And if you want anybody praying for you, you want Jesus to be praying for you, amen? Amen. He says, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And there's the plan. Satan's come to Jesus and said, here's what I want to do. I want to try to make Peter's faith fail. I've got a plan. And then he goes on and he says, and you, Jesus said, once you have turned again. And so Jesus knows Peter's going to fall. He says, but once you've turned back to me, strengthen your brothers. In other words, you're going to fail. Your faith is going to fail, but you're going to repent. When you do it, be a pastor. And in verse 33, it just goes over Peter's head like it always does. And it says, and he said to Jesus, Lord, with you, I am ready to go both to prison and to death. And then Jesus said, I say to you, Peter, the rooster will not crow today until you have denied me three times. Okay, you see that? Satan had this very specific and very unique plan, scheme, on how he wanted to take Peter out. And again, he had to ask permission, and I'll talk about it in a second, but it was specific. It wasn't random, all right? And I'll say this. I'll say this. I know that there's a lot of people in this room, and I've talked about this before, but, but if you're here today and you're kind of just a somebody that kind of comes and goes in and out of church and, and, and Jesus is not the center of your life. You're not really on fire for the Lord. You're not, you're a person that, maybe you come to church every once in a while, but you're not out there living on mission for God. You're not really making an impact for the kingdom of God whatsoever. I, I want you to know that, that Satan's probably not gonna mess with you. He probably doesn't have some grand scheme to take you out because he really doesn't have to. You really didn't have to. You've, you've already been deceived that, that Jesus is not the most important thing in your life. You've already bought the lie that, that Jesus is not worth living completely for with your life. And so he probably doesn't have some grand scheme. But I want to tell you guys something. 
If you are on fire for Jesus, if you do decide that I'm gonna live my life for the sake of the gospel, if you make the decision that I'm gonna go into some neighborhood or some place or some city or some country and I'm gonna put a stake in the ground and I'm gonna say I'm gonna live my life for Jesus Christ, I want you to know something. He knows your name. He knows your name. And he has a very specific plan for how he's gonna attack you. And that's why this chapter is so important. And that's why this series is so important because what Paul does is he tells us, look, the enemy is coming and here is how you're gonna fight him in the strength of the Lord. Okay, now, that's what Satan is. And I wanna real quickly tell you what Satan is not because it's just as important. Three things the Bible says Satan is not. Number one, Satan is not God's equal. The scripture's clear about that. Satan is not God's equal. The media, movies, they try to portray uh, God and Satan as equal but opposite counterparts of one another. That is not true whatsoever. Satan is a fallen angel. He is a creation of God. He's more like a counterpart of Michael or the angel Gabriel, but he's not God's equal. God is omnipotent, which means that God is all-powerful. Satan is not omnipotent. omnipotent. He is not all-powerful. His power is limited. God is omnipresent. And I never thought about this um, till recently, but God is omnipresent, which means he is in all places, everywhere, all the time. Satan is not omnipresent. He is a part of God's creation. He can only be at one place, at one time, and any given time. As a matter of fact, there's only like a handful of people, if you study in the Bible, where it specifically says that Satan is the one personally attacking them. I think we, we generally give Satan credit for all these different um, uh, evil attacks, but the Bible only, I think, mentions six or seven where, where Satan's the one doing the attacking. You've got Job, you've got Jesus, you've got Peter, you've got Judas, you've got Ananias, and then there's just like one or two random people where the Bible says Satan was actually doing this. But most of the time, it's just some random demon, one of Satan's angels that is the one doing the attacking. And so if you have a friend that's always saying, hey, Satan attacked me today, you can look back at him and go, eh, maybe not, you're not that important, right? Um, <laughs> you might have been attacked, but Satan probably wasn't the one attacking you, just so you're theologically correct moving forward. Um, God is omniscient. God is omniscient, which means he knows everything. Satan's not omniscient. He doesn't know everything. God is sovereign which means he rules and he reigns and he is in control of everything. Satan is not sovereign. He doesn't rule and he doesn't reign and he's not in control. The universe belongs to God, not Satan. The earth belongs to God, not Satan. Even hell belongs to God and not Satan. Satan is not God's equal. He's powerful, but we never forget that Satan's power is like a drop of rain in the Pacific Ocean of God's power. We just never forget that. All right, here's number two. And this is a cool one. It's scary, but it's awesome. Satan is not in control of his own actions. God is in control of Satan's actions. All right, we see that in the book of Job. Don't turn, I'll read it to you really quickly. In Job 1.6, it says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, um, From where have you come? And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there's none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? And then Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. Now watch what God says to Satan. He said, and the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your hand. Behold, all that he has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. Against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. So God looks at Satan and says, I'm going to give you permission to attack Job, but here are the parameters for which you can deal with him. Here's as far as you can go, and Satan, you cannot go any farther. 
You see it with Peter. You see it with Job. Satan has to come before the Lord and ask his permission to touch the hair on the head of a child of God. What that says is that there is nothing that's going to happen to you as a child of God apart from the permission of God. And you can walk out those doors. I don't care where you're going, 100 people. I don't care if you're going to a crazy place. You can walk out those doors in absolute confidence. Nothing is going to happen to you apart from the express permission of Almighty God. And you can trust in that today. All right? Satan is not God's equal. And he can do nothing apart from the permission of our God. All right? Lastly, Satan is ultimately not the cause of our sin. Satan's ultimately not the cause of our sin. I hear a lot of people say when they sin, they're like, oh, Satan got me. No, not really. That's not what happens. James chapter 1, verse 13, quickly. James says, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Watch what it says in verse 14. But each person is tempted... When he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. And so what, what uh, James is saying here is that, you know, you're going to have a sin baby. But the conception of it was not Satan. The conception of it was your own flesh. He's saying the reason that you sin, you, you definitely can be tempted by Satan. We see that with Jesus. Jesus was tempted by saying, but what James is saying is that when you sin, you sin because you wanted to sin. You're not a victim, a helpless victim of a satanic attack. You sin because in your flesh, that's what you wanted. You sin because you were being kind of shady. That's what the scripture was saying. And so that's what Satan is. And that's what Satan's not. Okay? And a lot of that, I want, I want to kind of end today. I want to give you just very, very quickly a couple of applications in light of what Satan is and what Satan's not. Here's the, here's the first application in light of what we learned today about our enemy. Number one, in light of the battle that, the, that, that we are in, the fight the scripture says we are in, here's number one, application. We need to believe and we need to live not in a peacetime mentality, but in a wartime mentality. In light of the fact the Bible says you're in a fight, we need to live in a wartime mentality, not a peacetime mentality. There are, there, there are too many people that think that the Christian life is an exit from warfare when in reality what the Bible teaches us is that the Christian life is an entrance into warfare. There are too many pastors out there saying, hey, come follow Jesus and everything's going to go smooth for you. That's not what the Bible teaches. Yes, he forgives you of your sin. Yes, he makes you, gives you a life worth living. But he never says that you follow Jesus, your life's going to be easy. The scripture tells us you follow Jesus, you're, you're getting into a war. And far too many Christians live their lives in a peacetime mentality, not a wartime mentality. mentality and that's why they're ineffective. Let me just read a quote to you from John Piper. Um, Pastor John Piper. He says, life is war. That's not all it is, but it is always that. And most people don't believe that in their hearts. Most people show by their priorities and their casual approach to spiritual things that they believe we are in peacetime, not wartime. Very few people think that we are in a war that is far greater than World War II. And even fewer consider that the casualties in this war do not merely lose an arm or an eye or an earthly thing, but lose everything even their souls, and enter a hell of everlasting torment. Until we feel the force of this, we will not pray or we will not live as we ought to. It's true. Too many of us right here in this room, we live in a peacetime mentality. Because when you're, when you're living in a peacetime mentality, you're going you're gonna to read your Bible when it's convenient to you. If you have time, you'll do it. But if you realize you're in a war... You're going to look at the word of God as something that is absolutely necessary in your life to, to experience the power of God so you can be victorious over the schemes of the enemy. When, when, you, uh, when you're living in peacetime, you're going to look at church as something you can do uh, if you have time or if it fits your schedule. But when you're living in a wartime mentality, you're going to realize that the, that the body of Christ and being inside of the, the protection and the love and the worship and the feeding of the body of Christ is something that's absolutely necessary in a world that you're at war in. 
When, when, you, when you realize you are at war, when you, when you begin to worship God, you, you're going to worship with everything you got. When you're living in peacetime, worship is just some time where you sing some songs until you get to the teaching. We have to have that subtle shift in our thinking, a biblical shift in our thinking where we understand, I'm going to go out these doors, but I'm at war. And it's an important shift to have. Number two, we remember again, application, that although we're in a fight with a brilliant and powerful enemy, powerful enough to deceive two unfallen minds, powerful enough that when a heavenly fight breaks out, God sends Michael to deal with it, even though we are fighting a very real and very powerful enemy, here's what I want you to remember. We need to remember that we do not fight that enemy in our own power, but we fight that enemy in the power of the Lord. Ephesians 6, 10 says, finally, Paul says, finally, Watch what he says. He says, be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. And in the strength of his might. He's like, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. We got some serious spiritual enemies coming our way. And you need to be strong, not in your strength. You need to not be strong in your might. He says, you need to be strong in the Lord. And you need to be strong in his might. And that's what this whole series is about, church that we're going to be going through for the next several weeks is we're going to teach you, we're going to walk through the Bible and we're going to teach you how the Bible says how you are to fight in his strength, this very real and determined and powerful enemy. Last thing and I'm done. We need to remember and never forget that although we are in a fight, we're in a war, we need to live in a wartime mentality, against a very real enemy that wants nothing more than destroy us. Listen carefully. You need to never forget that we already know the outcome of this war. A little spoiler alert. We win. We win. Satan has already been defeated at the cross. He's already been defeated at the resurrection of Jesus. All you got to do today is go open up the book of Revelation and you will see something. There's coming a day and it's coming soon that Jesus is going to take Satan and throw him in the lake of fire while he will be destroyed forever. And you and I who are in Christ Jesus are going to be standing there watching it happen. We win. We win. And you fight the fight, but you never forget that. And I think that's the sweet spot between the two extremes. You don't ever forget that you're in a very real battle but you walk in the battle as a person that realizes I'm fighting a battle that's already been won for me by the, by the cross of Jesus. Jesus said to the disciples, he asked them, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. And Jesus said to Peter, blessed are you, son, Peter. For flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but our father who is in heaven revealed that to you. And he said, Peter, it's upon this rock that I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We win. Don't ever forget that as you live for Christ. Let's pray. Father, I, I pray that we would do exactly that, that we would wake up, that we would be alert, sober-minded, that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against a very real enemy whose desire is to devour us and take us out. Father, I thank you that for those of us in the room that are in Christ Jesus, that um, we're victorious not by our strength, but by the strength of the blood of Christ. I pray that today as we stand and sing in just a second that we would sing not as a defeated people or an apathetic people, but we would sing as a victorious people. That we would shout and sing to you as a people redeemed, victorious. I pray for anybody in the room, Lord, that has never trusted in Jesus as their Lord and as their Savior. Anybody that's never asked you, God, to forgive them of their sin and trust in what you did on the cross so that they can be in relationship with you. I pray that in the best way they know how they do that right now, they'd give their life to you and that you would save them, Lord. 
Lord, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for the, all that you've done. And we proclaim today that you are worthy of our worship. And so it's in your name that we pray. And it's in your name that we sing. Amen. Amen. Church, let's stand together.